So my name is Lee Thomas. I am a speaker, I'm a writer, I'm a mental health advocate. I live with bipolar disorder, ADHD, trichotillomania, um, and, and social anxiety, um, which makes me really nervous to get up in front of a lot of people and speak, so becoming a speaker might have been a poor career choice. But there we are. Um, but that's what I do. I go around and I speak for a living. But what I really talk about is mental health, and I tell stories for a living, and I tell my own story. And people allow me to do that, which is pretty cool. But there's this big question that kind of hangs over me every time I do a speaking engagement. And for me, that question is why? Why do I tell my story even though it makes me so nervous? And why do people care? Why do people listen when I tell my story? How many people here have a favorite story? Any kind of favorite story? Maybe it's something that you read when you were younger, any kind of favorite story? Thanks to the people who put their hands up. You guys are great. Um, Stories are magical. Human beings love stories. There are four words that are the most compelling words in the whole human language. And those words are once upon a time. And so the story that I'm going to tell you today, like all good stories, starts with once upon a time. So once upon a time, there was a 12-year-old girl living in a small town in northern Alberta. And this girl, she had a lot of good things going for her. She was a varsity athlete, uh, a wrestler, the coolest sport. Um, she was a student council member. She had good grades. She seemed to have friends. So it seemed like she had a lot of objectively good stuff going for her. But this girl was living a lie. And the lie that she was living was that she was doing OK. See, because she had all of this good stuff going for her, no one ever would have guessed that she was really, really sick. So as you might have guessed, I was that 12-year-old girl, but as you might not have guessed, I was also one of the people who didn't know that I was sick. For as long as I can remember, I've had this voice in my head, and that voice hated me. I was never good enough, or strong enough, or smart enough, or funny enough, or pretty enough, or anything enough for it. And that made me feel really, really bad about myself. But instead of saying, hey, I feel really bad about myself, maybe that's a problem, I thought that my feelings were facts. And I thought that because I felt like I was a bad person, it meant that I was a bad person. That was the first lie that my mental illness told me. And that lie almost killed me. Because I decided, as someone who thought they were a bad person, I decided to fix myself. And the way that I decided to fix myself was by losing weight. Because we live in a society that tells us that losing weight is the most virtuous and admirable thing that you can do. And I wanted to be virtuous and admirable. It's a powerful story that's really pervasive in our society. So at the ripe old age of 12 years old, I went on my first diet. And I don't want to lie to you because this is a true story. So it worked for a little bit. I lost a little bit of weight, and I did feel a little bit better about myself. But then slowly, all of those old thoughts started trickling back in. And I felt like I wasn't good enough. And I felt like I wasn't smart enough, or strong enough, or funny enough, or pretty enough. And I got really, really angry. I got angry with myself because I thought I wasn't trying hard enough, because I just assumed that the story I had been told was true. I assumed that if I wanted to matter and be a good person, I had to lose weight. It never occurred to me that that story was a lie. So I decided to try harder, and I restricted food even more. A funny thing happens just biologically when you restrict food. Uh, your body thinks that you're starving to death, which in all fairness, you are. And so it slows your metabolism way down because it's trying to keep you alive, which actually makes it harder to lose weight. And it sends you all of these hunger cues. And that's like the caveman part of your brain because those hunger cues are supposed to be like, listen, you got to go catch a woolly mammoth and then you go catch it. Um, that's, <laughs> you, can, you can tell I know my anthropology. Um, and it also sends you this rush of adrenaline, so you have the energy to catch that woolly mammoth. But I was 12 years old, and I was not catching any woolly mammoths. So I had all of these hunger cues and all of this adrenaline coursing through my body, and it was messing up my head. So I, I was high on adrenaline and caffeine, and I was hungry, and I was just so, so angry. But it didn't occur to me at any point that this was a problem. Um, because I had so much going well in my life, I thought that I didn't deserve to be sad. I thought I didn't deserve to be struggling or deserve to be unhappy. I thought life was just this hard for, any, for everyone and that I was really, really ungrateful. And that made me even more angry at myself. And then one day, I snapped. It would have been in about eighth grade. And it was a normal day. I restricted food all day. I went to wrestling practice. And I came home from wrestling practice. And 
The closest I can describe this is that I went into a bit of a trance and I just ate all the food that I could get my hands on in my house. And I don't really remember doing that, but I remember how I felt when I was done. I was just overwhelmed with guilt and dread and shame because now I thought I'm never gonna achieve my goals, I'm never gonna be worth anything because I ate this food. And all those feelings of guilt and shame overwhelmed me and boiled down into one thought. And for me, that thought was, I have to get rid of it. So I went upstairs to the bathroom and I took my toothbrush and I shoved it all the way down my throat and made myself sick over and over and over again until all the food was gone. And I thought that would make me feel better. Spoiler alert, it did not. Um, no one in my town talked about mental illness, so I didn't have the words to describe what I had done. I didn't know the word binge, the word purge, the word bulimia. I didn't even really know what mental illness was. And even though I didn't have the knowledge to describe what I had just done, I knew enough to know that nobody could find out. And that made me feel even more guilty and even more ashamed. And I was just so filled with anger and guilt and self-loathing and self-hatred and shame and secrecy and more guilt. And those feelings really overwhelmed me and they were, they were burning in my head and I felt like I needed some sort of release. So I went to the shower and I took my razor and I dragged it all across my thighs and all down my arms because I thought that would make me feel better. Spoiler alert, it did not. I felt a thousand times worse. And because not only had I eaten all of this food, which I thought made me a bad person, not only had I made myself sick, which I thought made me a bad person, now I had also cut myself. I was so overwhelmed and I had no idea what to do. And I felt like if anyone found out, my life as I knew it would be over. I would be a freak and I would be an outcast. And so I knew that no one could find out, but at the back of my mind, I decided that someone was probably gonna find out eventually. And if I was gonna be a freak, if I was gonna be an outcast, I might as well be a skinny one. So I started restricting again. And that is how the cycle continued all through my high school years. And all through those years, I kept telling myself stories. Stories like, you deserve this. Stories like you're not good enough. Stories like you will never be good enough. Stories like no one will believe you if you tell them. Because I still didn't know that I was sick. I thought I was just a bad person with bad habits. I didn't know I had an illness. I thought I just had a moral failing. And because I didn't know I was sick, I didn't get help. I just accepted that this was my reality. And that continued to be my reality when I flew from the small town of White Court, Alberta to the bustling metropolis of Fredericton, New Brunswick. And because I didn't know I was sick, I didn't get help, and I ended up getting a whole lot sicker. In first year university, my whole life was numbers. It was, how much did I eat today? How many calories did I eat today? How much did I weigh today? How many kilometers did I run today? How many times did I go to the gym today? How many times did I binge and purge today? How many times did I cut myself today? How long can I keep going on with this? Because even at that point, I knew that my story had an ending. My hair was dry and breaking. My skin was dry. My hands were cracking from exposure to my stomach acid. I had stomach pains all the time. My throat was raw. And even then, I didn't get help because getting help was so scary. It was more scary to get help than it was to continue living the way that I was living because the way that I was living, in a lot of ways, my life was awful but it was familiar to me. It was an old, well-worn story. F recovery was unfamiliar. It was new. It was scary because no one I knew was telling stories about recovery. I didn't even know that recovery was possible. So I continued to not get help, and I continued to binge and purge and self-harm. And by the time I was 18 years old, in the summer of 2012, my life had settled into a bit of a routine. So I would wake up in the morning and I would go for a long run because in addition to still being on the wrestling team, I was also training for a half marathon. And then I would go to the gym. And I worked at the gym, I worked at the front desk. And I would work long shifts because I wanted to make money. And I wouldn't eat when I was there because the idea of being at the gym and eating as someone else was coming into exercise was way too scary for me. It was overwhelming. Even like the thought that people would see me eating 
made me shake with shame. I was so ashamed of the fact that I had to eat at all, that I had hunger, that I experienced human biological functions. Then after my shift at the gym, I would walk to the nearest grocery store, which was about a 10 minute walk away, and I would take my little recyclable grocery bags, and I would buy two bags of food. That was my rule. Eating disorders are full of rules, and that was my rule. I could buy two bags of food, and I could buy whatever food I wanted. And then I would walk home, which was about another 10 minute walk, and I would eat and eat and purge and purge and eat more and purge more and then self-harm and then go to bed. And that was my day. I did that every single day. And that routine sounds awful, like especially seeing it from, from this side. That routine was horrible, but it was safe to me. It was what I knew. Until one day, the routine betrayed me. It seemed like a normal day, it was in late May, and I went for my run, I worked at the gym, I went to the grocery store, I bought my two bags of food, and I remember being in the grocery store parking lot and kind of stumbling a little bit, and I remember thinking, well, that's not good. And then I thought, Lee, just get home, you're gonna be okay. And then I walked a little bit more and stumbled a little bit more, and I thought, okay, I just have low blood sugar. I'm gonna eat a little bit, and then I'll go home, and then I can binge and purge and self-harm and go to bed and call it a day. And I remember thinking, I'm just gonna have one little bite. And the next thing I knew, I had eaten all two bags of food right there in the Sobeys parking lot, cars, carts going by, and me there just binging. And when I kind of came to out of that binge, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Because there was nowhere nearby that I could purge and everyone had seen me eating and I was freaked out. So I sprinted home and I threw myself into the bathroom and I made myself sick like I had done a thousand times before, up to eight times a day for six years. But this time was different. And I felt this sharp pain in my stomach. And I saw blood. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up on the bathroom floor because I'd passed out, probably only for a couple seconds, but it felt like it had been a long time. And I remember thinking, I'm surrounded by, by blood and sweat and vomit and this is not okay and I just need to go to bed and pretend that this never happened. And that was what I planned to do. So I went to get up to go to bed and my legs just refused to work. My limbs just wouldn't obey my commands because my body was so exhausted, not just from everything I'd done that day, but from everything that I had been doing for the past six years. And so I ended up having to crawl from the bathroom to my bedroom and with my last ounce of energy, I was so certain that I was dying. That's how terrible I felt. I reached over to my journal that I kept by my bed, and I wrote the note that I thought they would find me with. And I wrote, I'm sorry. And I don't really know who I was apologizing to, but I knew that the game was up, that people would find me, they'd find the mess I made, and they'd know that I'd been lying for six years. And I thought that they would be mad at me. I thought that they would be disappointed in me. And so I just wanted them to know that I was sorry. But I woke up the next morning, I destroyed the note, and the next day I phoned counseling services. I was finally less afraid to get help than I was to continue living the way that I had been living, the way that I had been living for the past six years. And I began the difficult process of recovery. And slowly, slowly but surely, I got better. I wasn't cured, maybe I'll never be cured, but I was better. My life was finally more than just numbers. It was more than my eating disorder, it was more than my mental illness. But I still had my story, I still had everything I'd experienced weighing on me, and the weight of that felt like it was crushing me, and I desperately needed to tell someone. So, having bipolar disorder, I do tend to do things in a big way, so I wrote an article for my student newspaper talking about being gay, and talking about having a mental illness, and talking about what life was like in both of those closets. And I waited for Wednesday, and the article came out, and then I waited a little bit more, and the response that I got to that article changed my life. I had people emailing me, Facebook messaging me, stopping me after class, and even though their stories were all as unique as they were, there was three things that they had in common. They said, I hear your story. I have a story too. Thank you for showing me I'm not alone. And that is how the My Definition campaign got started, by people saying, I hear your story. I have one too. We are not alone. I found that there were people all across my campus with stories to tell. They were bursting at the seams trying to tell these stories, but they didn't know how. What my definition did was gave them a how. It was almost a year after the article that the first My Definition campaign launched in 2014. 
Now, almost two years later, there are over 60 faces of the My Definition campaign, including a campaign that's launching here at Dow. The faces of My Definition are our brothers, our sisters, our employees, our employers, our classmates, our teachers, our family, our friends. They describe themselves as being passionate, artistic, loving, caring, friendly. They're students, they're mothers, they're social workers, they're lovely and amazing and brilliant people. They have mood disorders and eating disorders, depression and anxiety, schizophrenia, OCD, ADHD, and much more. They describe themselves as struggling with, suffering from, recovering from, coping with, living with, or even simply having these issues. They have mental illnesses, but they have so much going on in their lives. Their mental health is a part of them, but it's not what defines them. They're real, whole, unique, dynamic individuals. They're the kind of people I wish I'd known when I was 12. So I want to come back to the why, why I tell my story, why people care when I tell my story. And I don't tell my story so people will feel scared or sad or pity me. I do it because there's a power in telling a story. When I was in the depths of my mental illness, I was terrified of that power. I thought it had the power to destroy my life. And I was scared and I was vulnerable and I didn't want to be looked at for only my mental illness. I tell my story because I want to change the way that we think about mental illness. That to let people know that people can have mental illness who are from a variety of personal backgrounds, of genders, of sexualities, that you can still be a real, whole, unique person and have a mental illness, and you can have a mental illness and still be a real, whole, unique person. I tell my story because I want people to know that this isn't abstract, theoretical stuff. There are real people on your campus who are struggling with mental health issues and terrified to reach out because of stigma, and I know that because I used to be one of them. I tell my story because in every audience there are people who feel like they're monsters, who have felt like they're monsters for a long time. And I want them to know that they're not monsters and that they're not alone. I tell my story because it's not just mine. It's your family members, it's your friends, it might even be yours. I want to share a quote with you um, by a writer named Wesley King. And he says, I cannot unknow the monsters, but I can become the person who would have saved 13-year-old me. We all have monsters. Mine happens to be mental illness, but we all have them. And we all have 13, 15, 20, 30, 80-year-old versions of ourselves that need to be saved. But if we're brave, and if we're vulnerable, and if we share our stories, we can also be the people who do the saving. Thank you.